Good morning. Blessings to each of you on this uh, first Sunday of the season of Advent. Uh, Advent uh, meaning something like arrival, as in the, the advent of the smartphone or the advent of the digital age. For the church, however, Advent is the four-week season of preparation, of prayer, reflection, leading us to the celebration of, of course, Christmas and the incarnation, the birth of Christ. So in that way, Advent somewhat mirrors Lent, which of course is our season of preparation leading us up to the celebration of Easter. As one writer has observed, Advent marks something momentous, cosmic, universe-altering, God's coming into our midst in the flesh. And that coming is not just something that happened in the past. This is not just a, a, an anniversary or a commemorative event, but it is a yearly opportunity for us to pause and consider the future, the fullness of God's kingdom coming on earth. Now, you all are uh, very aware that the world began celebrating Christmas already. Some however many weeks ago when the displays started going up in the stores and the commercials started appearing on television. But for us, for people of faith, Christmas actually is not until a, a bit away. It begins actually December 25th, runs through January the 5th, the day before Epiphany. Those 12 days are the season of Christmas and so more and more, I think that Advent, although it's hard because the world is pushing us to celebrate it now, Advent is a helpful corrective. It is a way of, of slowing down a bit, remembering what it is that we celebrate on December 25th and those days following. Advent can help us avoid the tendency to sentimentalize, romanticize, and commercialize the birth of our Lord because it helps us remember that the love that descended to Bethlehem is not the easy sympathy of a, of a kind and gentle God, but a burning fire that chases away every shadow, floods every corner, turns every midnight into noonday. This love born in Bethlehem that we'll celebrate at Christmas, this love for which we now watch and wait and prepare, reveals sin and overcomes it. It conquers darkness with such forcefulness and intensity that Scripture says it scatters the proud and the imagination of their hearts. It feeds the hungry and it sends the rich empty away. This is the transformation for which we are watching and waiting this Advent. Not just for Christmas cheer wrapped in boxes and bows and with lights and tinsel, but, but waiting, preparing, expecting nothing less than the transformation of the entire world. All because God draws near to us in Jesus Advent, then, is an opportunity for us to slow down, to pray, to confess, to remember that a transformation of this scale is not something we do, but something that God has done and will do on our behalf. So Bonhoeffer will say that Advent might be compared to a prison cell in which one waits and hopes, but is completely dependent upon the fact that the door must be opened from the other side. The door must be opened from the other side. It's not something we can do ourselves. This dependency, however, on God to act, to liberate us, to set us free, to make things new, does not release us from responsibility. If Advent is about expectancy, then it's an expectancy grounded in a readiness to act, to be bold to be faithful. Advent is about remembering that in the birth of Jesus, God has acted decisively on our behalf to inaugurate God's kingdom of righteousness and peace. And it's about expecting that God will act again and again. 
It's also about life in between those two acts. It's about how we're called to live in between the already and the not yet and prepare for the day when God's reign will come in its fullness. So it is a period of waiting and watching, a season in which we're caught between joyful expectation and, yes, the sometimes harsh realities of our present condition while we then wait for the promise to be fulfilled. The prophet Jeremiah was writing to a community that was acutely aware of the tension that comes with living in the hope of a promise yet to be fulfilled. In 587 BCE, the the city of Jerusalem had been completely destroyed by the Babylonian invasion. Two institutions that defined Israel as a people of God, the Levitical priesthood and the temple, were, were gone, destroyed. The people of Israel were scattered from their homeland, lived as a conquered people in Babylon. Their way of life had literally been overturned. Their sense of security had been violated. They had no idea if they would live to see their home again. They were in exile. And exile is a dark and difficult and frightening place. And when exile comes, it leads to all sorts of hard questions. Where is God in the midst of this? Why did this kind of devastation happen to us? Is is God still with us? Can God be trusted now? Will God allow us to return home? What happened to the promises God had made? Are they still valid for the generation's to come. It's in this context that the writer of Psalm 137 laments, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered our home. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How could we sing with joy, with hope, the Lord's song when all was lost and hope fleeting? Indeed, what do you do when exile comes? when the future seems uncertain at best. Maybe we or, or someone we know has been or is in that place, experiencing something like exile, like living in a, a, a foreign and strange land where the world's been turned upside down. Nothing seems comforting or familiar, where there's a great distance between the reality of what is and and what we had hoped would be. In in a place that seems hopeless, where it's it's hard to sing the songs of faith because the, the words seem wrong and the music is just dissonant. Now, I don't want to put a damper on the the beginnings of this Christmas season, but I think of the millions of souls for whom Christmas will not be merry. Anything but joyful. Because they find themselves exiled from all the things that bring comfort and hope. In the midst of an ongoing pandemic of instability in our political systems, around the world, growing economic inequality, so many souls exiled from safety and from health and from a better future and literally from their family and friends caught somehow in the middle, in between. Maybe they once knew and heard and believed the promises of God were true. There was a time when life was good and full and rich and filled with hope and joy, when the future was certain and promising, but now that's just a memory. I recall in Theology of Hope, Jürgen Moltmann observed, totally without hope, we cannot live. To live without hope is to cease to live. Hell is hopelessness. It's no accident, Montman writes, that above the entrance to Dante's hell is the inscription, leave behind all hope, you who enter here. So what, what do we do when life seems more like a burden than a blessing? 
When the chasm between what was and what could be, between life and the fullness of life as God intends it, seems to be too wide to to be overcome. Maybe there's still a glimmer of hope out there somewhere that things might get better, but that seems a long way off. How do you live in between? That was Jeremiah crushed by what was happening to his people, carrying the burden of exile deep within his own being. Jeremiah writes, For the hurt of my poor people I am hurt. I mourn, and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? So what does Jeremiah do in this time in between? I mean, he could throw in the towel, become a bitter, angry old man, walk away from God and his vocation as a prophet. Who would blame him? I mean, that all seems reasonable. Instead, he does something quite remarkable. He's being held captive in the king's court because, remember, kings don't like it when you tell them their kingdom is about to come to an end. He can see the Babylonians at the city gates, the siege ramps going up, He knows the end is near. All the inhabitants have been carted off somewhere else to live in some strange foreign land. To say that things are bad is an understatement. It's hell. It's hopelessness. It's the end of the world as Jeremiah knew it. And so in the midst of what seems like a completely hopeless time, with Israel's glory days behind them, nothing but devastation lying in front of them, Jeremiah does a foolishly faithful thing. He buys land. He goes out and buys land. I mean, in a nation being taken over by an occupying force, Jeremiah buys land. When all hope seems lost, when the way forward is uncertain, Jeremiah invests in God's future. Not out of naive optimism, but because he remembers how God has been faithful in the past and so trusts that God will be faithful in the future. He may never see how Israel will be restored. He may never till or tend that field. He may never reap a single harvest from it. But because he has known God to be faithful, has seen God's care for Israel in the past, Jeremiah has hope for the future, grounded in an unwavering trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God. And that hope, not optimism, but hope, that that expectation shapes how Jeremiah lives in between. So when everything around him is falling apart, Jeremiah boldly claims, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to Judah. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will live in safety. Though he can't see it, he believes it's coming. On the horizon, God will act. All will be well. In the face of devastation, when all the evidence says something to the contrary, Jeremiah trusts that God's promises are true. And as a sign of that hope, he doubles down, bets on God, and buys a plot of land. Advent is about learning how to live with hope when there seems to be a great chasm or or gap between what is and what we wish could be. It's about living each and every day, trusting that God will finish what God has, has started, even if we can't see when or how. The good news of Christmas, the good news for which we watch and wait and prepare, is that Jesus, Mary's son, is actually the fulfillment of Jeremiah's hope. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that Jeremiah longed for. And in Christ Jesus, God restores the fortunes of Israel. And along the way, includes us Gentiles as well. Perhaps not quite the way Israel or Jeremiah imagined it would happen. 
But in Jesus, exile is overcome once and for all. Drawing near to us, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to love us and heal us and make us whole. In Christ, all of creation is renewed and restored. All the cosmos is renewed and restored. Jesus is not only the glory of his people Israel, he's also the light of all nations, the high priest, the sacrificial lamb, and taking all the sin and the shame and brokenness of the world on himself on the cross, he exhausts it in one final act of love. Advent reminds us that the undoing of creation's exile began in the birth of Jesus and will be fulfilled when Christ comes again in glory. Because God has acted decisively in Christ, we then, like Jeremiah, trust that God will bring to completion what God has already begun. So when we approach Bethlehem's manger this year, it's important that we remember that it it was not only as a baby that Jesus lay there, This child was the same man who was crucified on Golgotha and who rose again. Within the manger lies the cross and Easter and our hope of a new life. So we're called to live expectantly, prepared on the edge of our seats, waiting, watching to see what God might do next. Called to live each present moment like Jeremiah, investing in God's future, joining in the work of God's building God's kingdom, trusting that God will be faithful even when we can't see where or how. That's the good news as we lean towards Christmas. God is faithful even when it's hard to see. In Jesus, God has reached out across the distance to us. God is with us in every moment of joy and every season of exile. Here, in between what is and what we hope might be, God is with us. And because Jesus is God with us, there is hope. Even when all the evidence in life says something to the contrary, there's hope. Because the little child of Bethlehem is the Lord, our righteousness. And Christ indeed holds all our futures. Thanks be to God. Amen.